Man, don't, don't you just love those stories of how God's at work in people's lives? And I uh, love seeing the Anderson girls sharing their story. John Murray talking about being in China. You know, he's one of our elders, if you didn't know that, here at Snellville. And then, you know, Olu and Shola move in here to do a season with the fellowship. And I'm watching that. I'm like, man, either we are crazy people at Grace, like just crazy, like just lunatics, or, or Jesus is really up to something. And I loved how Olu put it. He said, I want my kids to grow up knowing that my parents heard the voice of God and responded, and, and, that, and that Jesus is worth it. And so here we are, Grace Snellville, good morning, welcome, and we are part of that wider Grace family of churches, and it's a beautiful thing to be part of something bigger than just our local expression. And of course, you may not know this, but as a church, we do support the Grace Family organization significantly from our general offering budget. And so when you give to Grace Snellville, 5% of everything that comes in goes toward supporting the family and all those projects that we just heard about. And then periodically, the family does above and beyond asks uh, to individual churchgoers as well. You heard Matt mention that goal and we just invite you to pray about giving toward that. gfc.tv slash give is how you can do that. Um, at the same time, if you were here last week, you heard us talking a little bit about local giving here at Snellville. And, you know, year to date, we are on our just general giving down about 15%. So pray about that too. Uh, <laughs> the good news, the good news is that whether you're talking about the Grace Family Organization or you're talking about our local church here in Snellville or we're talking about your personal finances, uh, God's promise for all of us is the same, that he will provide what we need at the organizational level, at the church level, at the personal level. Like we saw last week, Paul says, the secret of facing plenty and facing hunger, that the secret of facing abundance and need is the confidence that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so that's, that's kind of where we are. I invite you to open up your Bible to the book of Joel, chapter 1, and we're going to start a new series this morning. Uh, if you need a Bible, slip up your hand. We'll put a Bible in your hand. Also, if, uh, if you need one of these note sheets that Joshua mentioned, the connection card at the bottom, you can get that with a hand in the air. And of course, we are going to take communion um, at the end of the gathering, so if you didn't get communion stuff, I think we can get, get those in your hands as well. Let's see here. I need my computer to wake up and give me my next slide. I don't know why it's... Hello, computer. Hey, Cameron, could you go back there and just, like, advance my slide, maybe? I don't know why it's not doing that. But um, this new summer series is actually called, as a series, the Book of the Twelve, which is what the Jewish community calls the writings of the Twelve Prophets whose books are found just before the beginning of the New Testament in your Bibles. There it is. Great slide. There we go. All right, we're hop, hopping now, up and running. And, um, and you know, these, these prophets, these, these 12 prophets, they brought the word of the Lord to God's people over the course of several hundred years. At certain points, they warned the people about coming judgment from God. At other times, uh, they brought comfort, especially after the judgment of exile had occurred. And when you read through these prophets, sometimes their words are really scary, and other times they're deeply comforting. Sometimes their words are really hard to understand. Other times it's crystal clear. So, uh, sometimes you, you think it's like this is thousands of years old, and then other times you're reading it and you're going, man, this is so amazingly relevant to today, it almost hurts. But here's the thing, when we're reading through these prophets and their words, uh, we have to keep in mind what Jesus said about their writings. Very, very famous and familiar scene in the book of Matthew. A lawyer comes up to Jesus, says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then this is what Jesus says, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So this summer, as we read through the words of the prophets, we have to remember 
that they are always directing us back to loving God and loving neighbor. Not one at the expense of the other, or the other at the expense of the one, but every time we read these prophets, we come back to Jesus' words. He says, they all point us toward that great command, loving God and loving neighbor. It all hangs on that. Now, when we get to the book of Joel and our reading for the book of Joel, I want to set the scene, the, the kind of imagination for you uh, with uh, an image from that movie, Gone with the Wind. How many of you guys saw Gone with the Wind? A lot of you, but, you know, it was like 1939, I think it came out, so before a lot of us were born. And, of course, it's the saga from the Civil War. It's here in the South. And Scarlet, the protagonist, uh, just before the intermission, because it kind of is a movie in two parts, she returns to Terra. And the plantation has been devastated by the soldiers coming through. And maybe you remember she kind of stumbles out into the fields around the plantation, scrabbles in the dirt and finds a carrot and kind of carelessly brushes the mud off the carrot, eats it. This is a scene from the movie there. And for whatever reason, from the time I was a little kid, this scene just stuck in my mind, the scene of the desolation of the fields. And so now, whenever I read the book of Joel, this is sort of the image that comes to mind. Listen to what Joel writes in chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust is eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust is eaten. What the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. When you hear Joel describing the devastation left behind by the locusts, maybe this picture from Gone with the Wind, comes to mind. And remember back in this time in Israel, when your whole economy is basically farming, locusts coming through and eating everything is a catastrophe. And Joel describes wave upon wave of these cutting, swarming, hopping, destroying bugs just carving through your fields. Can you imagine if you're a farmer watching those swarms rise on the horizon and then come near and you're hoping against hope that maybe they'll pass over your gardens and they don't. In verse 7, Joel talks about how the vine and the fig tree are laid waste. And if you get familiar with the words of the prophets, this book of the Twelve, the vine and the fig tree are a recurring picture, an image of a sustainable household and family. It's like the Israelite equivalent of the American dream. You know, maybe you talk about the American dream of getting a house and a white picket fence. Well, in the, in the prophets, the Israelite dream is having a vine and a fig tree because you can sustain life. You got fruit. And you got grapes. And here now in Joel 1, the locusts have destroyed the economy and obliterated the Israelite dream. They've laid waste my vine, splintered my fig tree. And it raises this question, what do God's people do when we face a society-wide catastrophe on this scale? And Joel says two things. First, 
lament. We cannot live in denial. In these first 13 verses, seven times, he tells the people to cry out, lament, and wail. But then the second thing that Joel tells the people to do is to interpret the times, understand what this means. And Joel says that this locust event is a sign that the day of the Lord is near. Now, if we go to chapter two, the scene shifts from the locust invasion that has been now to what is coming with the day of the Lord. He says, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Now in chapter two, the scene changes from the locusts that had come to now a second coming invasion. Joel says this second invasion is going to be even worse than the locusts. That that soldiers from the north, down in verse 20, are gonna swarm the land. And it even says that this is the Lord's army. It's basically, moving from chapter one to chapter two, Joel says that if you thought the locusts were bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. And Joel is making this point as he tells the people to interpret the times. He's making this point that the locust invasion of chapter one is a very clear sign and reminder that life can change in a day. That the whole world could be turned upside down in a moment. And it's easy for us to forget that because we, in our everyday routines, we get set in our rhythms and we kind of get to a place where we think, well, life is just stable and things are never going to change. And even if the Bible does make some promise that at some point God is going to show up and deal with the world, this day of the Lord that Joel talks about, yeah, okay, it's in the Bible, but it's not going to happen in my day. It's, It's easy to sort of get into our rhythms and, and think, okay, yeah, that promise is out there, but it's more like head knowledge. It's not something that we really carry with us on a day-to-day basis. That at any point, Jesus would return and the world would be set to rights in this day of the Lord. And truth be told, most of us are probably more aware of the day of the week than the day of the Lord. Today's Sunday, tomorrow's Monday. That means I gotta get things going. And we think about the days of the week. Joel's saying, just remember the day of the Lord. And the fact that the locust came through and turned your whole world upside down, basically overnight, is a reminder that God is real. And he has a day. And it should be a bit of a shocking jolt to your system. And what do we do with that? What do we do with the locusts when they devastate the fields? What do we do when we hear that the day of the Lord is coming? Well, I'll tell you what Scarlett did in the movie. It's one of the most famous scenes in the whole movie. After scarfing down that dirty carrot in the middle of the fields, she lifts her fist in defiance. And she says, as God is my witness, as God is my witness, they're not going to lick me. I'm going to live through this, and when it's all over, I'll never be hungry again, she says. No, nor any of my folk. If I have to lie, steal, cheat, or kill, as God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again. And in the movie, of course, the soundtrack is swelling, and we hear that, and we go, oh yeah, look how gritty and tough she is. Life put her down, but she won't take it. She's going to cheat, steal, kill, lie to make sure she never goes hungry again. 
And isn't that so typically human? I mean, there's a reason we relate to that grit, you know? It's like, yeah, yeah. Because when we go through these kind of devastating experiences, it's easy for us to raise a fist to God and say, well, God, you're my witness. I'm going to take matters into my own hands and make sure I never let this happen again. Now, that's, that's a pretty human response. And we've seen some of those fists shaken to the sky over the last few years. Maybe you've shaken your fist for one reason or another. Uh, but the prophet Joel says there's actually a much different approach in the midst of catastrophe. Uh, that, that yes, we can lament, yes, we wail, it's crucial, but something else entirely is needed in these moments when the world is turned upside down. There it is, the image of Scarlet shaking her fist at heaven. But here's what Joel says when we come into these times of devastation and catastrophe. Verse 12, yet even now, declares the Lord, right? Your, your, your fields have been devastated by the locust and there's another day coming with invasion and it's going to be terrible. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. So Joel says, contrary to scarlet strategy and gone with the wind, Joel says, when crisis hits, it's a reminder that God is real. And when you are reminded that God is real, you need to return to God. I was reading this passage just wondering how our nation how our world today would handle an invasion of locusts like Joel described in chapter one. Surely our, our best scientists would fast track the development of pesticides to deal with the locust. Our politicians would start working on relief policies, some locust stimulus plans. Our news media would begin to publish daily reports about the impact of the new cutting locust variant, or the new swarming locust variant, or the new hopping locust variant. They might even assign Greek letters to each variant. And all that is well and good. God gave a scientist to research and the media for some reason, but, <laughs> and I guess we need politicians, but... <laughs> All that's well and good, all that's well and good, but, but it's not what Joel says is the first priority of God's people. When the locusts devastate your land, Joel says, repent and return to God. This is a rhetorical question, which means don't raise your hand. How many of you would say that over the last few years, your relationship with God has become deeper and more transparent? How many of you would say over the last few years, as many things in our life and our world have been turned upside down, how many of you would say you've become more humble, more aware of your stubborn self-centeredness? How, how many of us have become more gracious, and more generous toward our neighbors. How many of us have obeyed what Joel says is the proper response in the midst of a crisis? Joel says when you go through a crisis, it's a reminder that God is real, that his day is still coming, so repent. And this is what's amazing, because down here in verse 14, Joel says, who knows whether he will not turn and relent? Who knows? You know why he says that? Because God is not a machine. 
You don't just turn around and push the repent button and automatically get the result. God is real and free and mighty and powerful. And so we repent, we turn to God. We confess where we've gone astray. We tell him about the pain of what we've lost. And God is free to respond according to his nature. It's not some mechanized interaction. You realize that? Oh, if I just give this amount of money, or if I just volunteer this many times, or I just get back into church every Sunday, then everything's going to be set right. No, there's this, there's this real relationship that God wants with us. Not mechanistic, not technological, real and personal. Where we come back to God in humility, and we tell God, hey, we need you. And that's so much better because when we turn to God in authenticity and God looks at us, uh, it's not some quid pro quo, it's not some push a button, this is what comes out of the machine. It's, it's God in his incredible grace and mercy who responds with more than we could ever imagine ourselves. Who knows, says Joel, whether he will not turn and relent. It's a bit of an open question here. And we don't even know exactly here in chapter two how the people respond. We we don't know if there's a national turning, if they have big gatherings and return to worship. We don't know. We do know that down here in verse 18, something changes in God's approach to his people. It says, then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. We don't know if the people repented, but we do know that God relented. He showed mercy. He makes all these promises. He's going to overturn the threatening armies to the north. He calls the land and the people to rejoice in these passages. He says, you will know that I am in the midst of my people. And then there comes another promise. Verse 28, and this is where we're going to camp out as we wrap up this sermon. God makes these kind of promises to bless them in their present crisis of locust barrenness. But then he makes another set of promises that will be fulfilled farther down the road. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward. This is 2 verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Now chapter 3 goes on to share about how in this day of the Lord, God will judge the nations. And those who continue to reject God experience judgment. But it's interesting because this idea of the day of the Lord really is the central theme of the book of Joel. He mentions it five times. And it's clear for Joel that those who are redeemed, those who turn to God, experience the day of the Lord as a great day of rejoicing. Whereas those who are resistant to God experience the day of the Lord, his presence in our midst, as a day of great difficulty and judgment. That's what you see in chapter 3. But here, as we zero in on these last few verses for this morning at the end of chapter 2, it will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Imagine reading this 
hundreds of years before Christ came. What would you make of it? Well, you'd think at some point God is going to pour out his spirit, whatever that means. And maybe the first thing you would notice about this verse is that the promise is he would pour out his spirit on all flesh. It says, uh, the old and the young. That when the Spirit of God is poured out, the generation gap begins to heal. I remember, it's a couple years ago now, we were walking in Lowburn on the walking trail by our house, me and Amy, and there's a group of like four or five high schoolers walking toward us, and their clothes were just ridiculous. It's like one of them was wearing a letter jacket with nothing underneath. That doesn't make any sense. (laughs) Several pairs of pants that I was just like, why would you even be caught in public with those? Just the whole thing, some head, like hats and headbands and things. But this was not a dress up moment. These were just high schoolers out in the wild walking (laughs) from point A to point B. And I just didn't understand it. And once they went past, I I looked to Amy, I said, well, I think it just happened. I'm now on the other side of young. (laughs) I used to be a young guy. I used to be cool and hip. I used to get it. No longer. I'm on the other side of the generation divide. Welcome. You're... (laughs) Thank you, thank you. Hopefully you understand my shirt. Uh, (laughs) But man, the generation gap is real, isn't it? I talk to so many of you parents. I don't understand my kids. I talk to a lot of your students, a lot of the kids. I don't understand my parents. Massive gap between generations. Here's what Joel says. When we repent and return to God, there's coming a day when the Spirit of God will be poured out, and part of the work of the Spirit of God is bringing back together the generations, healing those gaps and those divides, the old and the young. The sons and the daughters, male and female, the Scripture says. It it heals the gender divides. When the Spirit of God is poured out, you get men and women living into everything that God has created them to be. Neither one pressed into some diminished role or dominating role, but both fully living as God made them to be, male and female. Even in our marriages, the promise of the Spirit poured out means there can be healing and peace and reconciliation between husbands and wives. Sure, you can look at this and and hear it and go, oh yeah, God's promising to do stuff widespread in the community of his people between men and women. That's amazing. But even at the basic family level, you realize to be married well, you need the Holy Spirit's help. Just to like love your wife and for your wife to love you, men, and vice versa, women. Like we need the Holy Spirit pour it out. If we're going to have any shot of living as the husbands and the wives God calls us to be. And then finally, there's this pouring out of the Spirit onto even the male and female servants, it says. The lower class of people socioeconomically, the, the slaves, you might even say, receive the Spirit. That this gift of the Holy Spirit is not only healing the generation gap and gender gaps, It's healing the socioeconomic divide between people. And if you're reading this before the time of Christ, you might wonder, like, what what will this be like? What, what uh, What kind of world would this be that Joel promises? The Spirit poured out, and these huge dividing lines in society being obliterated, in the healing power of God's spirit. You know the answer? What will it be like? When will this happen? Pentecost Sunday. 
See here, if we fast forward from Joel, Jesus comes to the earth, word of God, made flesh, announces the arrival of the kingdom of God, invites disciples to follow him, dies on the cross for our sins and the defeat of evils, resurrected on the third day, and then the scripture says he's with his disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God for 40 days. Then, at the beginning of the book of Acts, he ascends into heaven and says, wait for the Holy Spirit, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And this little group, for 10 days, huddles in an upper room, doors locked, windows drawn for fear of the authorities, praying together, God, what's the pouring out of your spirit going to look like? And then on the day of Pentecost, which was one of the great Jewish festivals celebrating the first fruits of the harvest, on that day of Pentecost, at a certain point, it says there's the sound of a mighty rushing wind in that upper room. And they looked around and they saw over every one of the disciples gathered, probably about 120 of them, were these little flames of fire, not consuming, burning fire, but spiritual fire over each one. And as that wind sound rushed through the house and those flames appeared over their heads, they burst forth from their upper room of fear into the streets. And they started telling the story of Jesus talking about how he had come and died for them and how he'd been resurrected and how there's an opportunity to return to God, to repent, that they might be saved. And of course, because of the Pentecost festival, there were people from all around the world who had gathered into Jerusalem. Not all of them spoke Aramaic, the everyday language of those folks. And yet, when, when they spilled out of that upper room and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they started to, to speak and it says that people heard the good news in their own language. And we find out that the work of the Holy Spirit is not just healing divisions between generations, divisions between men and women, divisions between socioeconomic gaps, but also divisions between nations and ethnicities and language groups. And as all this is happening in Jerusalem, the city is abuzz, the church is being born, the Spirit is being poured out. Peter, the apostle, stands up. And he begins to explain what's happening. And if you recall in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, Peter quotes these verses from Joel 2. That it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. But Peter interprets the events of Pentecost with these very promises from the prophet Joel, that this is now happening, that the day of the Lord has begun, and the experience of the Lord's presence among us, for those of us who've repented and trusted in Jesus, is a beautiful, brilliant, powerful experience. And when you read through that Pentecost story, we find out, okay, yeah, the Holy Spirit will act as our guide. Each one of us individually has a personal pillar of flame. In the wilderness, the people of Israel follow the pillar of flame as a community. Now, every person has the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells every believer. It says they are all filled with the Holy Spirit. He empowers the believers. They go out and they're speaking in other languages. He regenerates the believers. They're transformed from terrified individuals to bold witnesses, preachers in the street. But what Joel emphasizes here is another aspect of what the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer. Yes, the Holy Spirit guides us. He indwells us. He empowers us. He regenerates us. But here Joel says that the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing together all the broken fragments of society in his own power, he does it through prophecies and dreams and visions. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Well, what does that mean? And I think sometimes I can interpret it to mean that you know, the, the Holy Spirit's just going to tell each one of us exactly what awesome thing we're going to do in our lives. It makes me think of the old movie, The Three Amigos. 
and Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Chevy Chase, you know, the, the three Hollywood actors, and they think they're going to get this big reward, this payoff, and so they're sitting there one night and saying, what are you going to do with your share of the money? Steve Martin goes, I'm going to big, shiny silver car and drive it around Hollywood. And Chevy Chase says, I'm going to travel New York, Paris, be a big shot for a while. Of course, he gets to Martin Short. He says, I'm going to start a foundation for homeless children. And the first two guys go, well, yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I'm not going to buy the car until I start the other foundation. I was going to do the same thing, you know. But I think sometimes when we read this verse about dreams and visions and prophecies, we kind of have a tendency to think, oh, yeah, well, it's kind of this, oh, what do we got? I'm a, my big shiny silver car or maybe some great work for God or, or something like that. I mean, sometimes I read this and I think, okay, so pouring out the Holy Spirit means I'm going to have some million dollar idea uh, but if, maybe if it's not a million dollar idea, it's going to be some awesome ministry thing. When I was in my 20s, that was like the only way I could read this verse. But like I said, um, I'm not 25 anymore. <laughs> maybe, maybe on the other side of the generation gap. And I've seen a lot of people do awesome stuff. I've seen a lot of people have amazing God dreams and God vision. Like John Murray sharing in the video up there. God bringing together these themes in his life and getting to be involved in some of the work at Kosovo that's still going on over there. I've seen people get healed. It's awesome. But I've also, at this point in my life, seen a lot of people not get healed. And I've seen a lot of people in tough circumstances, and their circumstances just didn't change for a long time. And they prayed, and they're godly, and they repented, and they sat before the Lord. And they have the same Holy Spirit poured out on them as the Holy Spirit and work, who's at work in the lives of the people who are doing the big things. So as I've sat with this verse and wrestled with this promise, what, what does this mean? It's been so helpful for me to see and remember that the whole book of Joel is focused on that day of the Lord. And that the locust invasion should spark the recognition that God is real and God's going to deal with the world. And when God returns in our midst, God is going to set all things right. And those opposed to God will experience judgment. And those who are with God in Christ will rejoice. And it's so easy, like we were talking about earlier, to lose sight of that reality. But when we have the Holy Spirit, Joel is promising that at the very least, the work of the Holy Spirit, giving us dreams and prophecies and visions, is the truth that the Lord is going to return, and when he does, all shall be well. And all manner of things shall be well. And if we know that, if we are firmly convicted of that deep in our hearts, whether we experience deliverance or walk in suffering, we can still walk with God. There's an incredible passage in Hebrews 12. You don't have to turn there, but or at the end of Hebrews 11, going into Hebrews chapter 12, you don't have to turn there. But, but in that passage, it goes where... The author talks about how all these people were delivered from lions and saved and miraculous interventions and all this awesome stuff. And then, without hardly skipping a breath, the author goes on to talk about all the other people who didn't experience the miraculous interventions. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They're stoned, sawn two, killed with the sword. They wore sh sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. And they were those of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, it says, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. And here's the thing in that Hebrews 11 verse. Some people experience incredible, miraculous deliverance in this life. Others didn't. 
but both what unites them is that they looked forward in faith to the day of God's redemption. And the promise here in the book of Joel is that in that day of redemption, we will dream dreams and we'll have visions and we'll prophesy. It doesn't mean every one of us will have this perfect, amazing plan to personal success. Actually, for a lot of us, it means we're going to keep walking in probably some difficult circumstances because that's where God's put us, to be witnesses and lights, to be faithful. And that might mean for some of us that walk, even though the Holy Spirit's poured out on us, that walk is going to be heavy, challenging, difficult. But the reassurance of the book of Joel and the thing that comes back again and again and again through the whole scripture is the good news that because of what Jesus has done, we can rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, even through the challenging things. And the Holy Spirit will affirm in us that no matter what happens in this life, whether we have much or little, whether we're abounding or we are in need, there's coming a day of the Lord when all will be set right. And if we know that truth of the day of the Lord, what is there that we cannot face? What is there that we cannot face? And so the fulfillment of this promise of Joel, the Apostle Peter says, happened on the day of Pentecost. And it continues to happen every time one of us turns to God. When someone opens their heart, puts their trust, their faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is poured out, whether it was those believers in the first upper room there in Jerusalem, or it was Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 over there by Caesarea. Every time people open their hearts to Jesus, the Spirit is poured out. And that clarity about what part we play in the great plans of God begins to emerge in our lives and we're transformed. This is what Joel's talking about. And so, as we conclude, I invite you to get your communion elements out. And for our communion meditation, as we think about Joel and Joel's words, It's, a, it's an invitation for us to hear what Joel says in the midst of devastation and hard times. We come back, we repent. Uh, maybe some of you have been like Scarlett O'Hare, shaking your fist up to heaven, saying, I'm never gonna let this happen to me again, whatever it is you're going through. And we hear the words of Joel saying, no, 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 our response in crisis is Repentance. And, and we do, we, we remember that Jesus was with his disciples the night before he was crucified and he says, this is my body broken for you and he passed around bread. He said, I want you to eat this in remembrance of my sacrifice. And then he passed around the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you, the blood of the new covenant. And so the action of communion in many ways is the action of, of returning to the Lord. It's receiving the gift of his Salvation, once again, it's renewing our deep awareness of what God has done for us. That in crisis, our response is not to shake our fist and fix it ourselves, but it is to turn to Jesus and receive his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness. That's what's here. But then, this Pentecost Sunday, as we remember the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out, we remember that it's not just that Jesus forgave our sins, though that's amazing, not just that Jesus paid the price for our wickedness, though that is worth rejoicing over, is that in addition to that, Jesus himself, through his spirit, comes to dwell in us, to live in us, and to illuminate the parts of our hearts and the parts of our minds that drift toward despair. So as we hold these elements, I, I want you to, to look at these and remember, okay, this is, these are physical reminders of the spiritual reality of what Jesus did. Um, 
but it's also through this death and resurrection of Jesus that we receive the Spirit of God. Poured out afresh, healing generations, healing relationships. And so let's pray, Lord, thank you for your scripture that speaks so powerfully today. We hold these elements and we're just so grateful that you made a way for us to be united and restored with you. That when we return, you relent. You do not bring punishment, but you extend blessing. And you promise your own presence, your Holy Spirit, to be poured out upon us. And Lord, we ask that today we would experience that pouring out of your spirit in greater measure. Lord, we need your spirit. We need the fulfillment of this promise. On our own, we mess up. And we confess that, Lord. We receive the gift of your grace and our hearts are open to the pouring out of your spirit. God, I do ask for us, for our church, for our family of churches, for our families, for our students and kids downstairs, Lord, I pray that we would see the fulfillment of this promise in our day, over and over, and in greater measure, the pouring out of your Spirit on all flesh, and that we would see the impact of your Holy Spirit healing the divides and gaps that we see between us, and that we see with the world. And so, Lord, it is with all that in our hearts that we eat this bread and say thank you for giving up your body for us. And we drink this cup, and we say thank you for your shed blood. Thanks for watching this Grace Snellville video. We want to help you get connected to everything happening around the Grace Snellville community. We want to pray with you and we want to help equip you to follow Jesus well. Would you just take a moment even now to go to our website at gracesnellville.com. We hope to see you soon.